scripture reading today is taken from the fourth chapter of Matthew, the first 11 verses. Then was Jesus led up in, of, up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up unto the holy city, and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all of the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou shalt fall down and worship, fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Here endeth the reading. Before I begin the sermon for today, I just want to share a, a, a short story with you that came to me this morning. I've talked to you, some of you, about uh, an elder in the church I grew up in. His name was Brother Bob. And Brother Bob was in his 80s when I was eh, probably about seven or eight. And every once in a while, Brother Bob would be the liturgist for the church. And as, there was, as in that church, the liturgist led the prayers as well. And Brother Bob said the longest prayers you have ever heard in your entire life. He would make sure that he hit every single thing and in a very measured tone as he went. To the point where when we were kids, if Brother Bob stood up to pray that day, we would get a watch and we would time him. And we were keeping track of the record for how long Brother Bob would pray that day. And I have to tell you, as I was doing joys and concerns this morning, I had this picture of Brother Bob in heaven either looking at me and going, that's how you pray, son. Or looking at his watch and saying, you just set the new record. I'm very, very proud of you. So uh, just kind of a moment in my brain that popped in there. And, uh, you know, I I'm thankful for the influence that he had upon me. But I hope that I never break the records that he has set. So to our sermon. Uh, this year, as we move into our Lenten season, we're going to be hearing a series of sermons based on the idea of boot camp for the soul. And when we think about the boot camp idea, obviously the military is what immediately pops into our mind. I know some of you have been through boot camp in the military, and that is where we do get this term from. Um, it's when new recruits report to camp to start the process of becoming a soldier. And while a recruit is in boot camp, they undergo intense physical conditioning and also learn the basics of soldiering. Now, a boot camp in our modern society has come to mean more than just the beginning of military training. You hear this uh, applied to all sorts of things, exercise programs, educational programs, training programs. They all get called this boot camp of whatever it may be. But for our purposes, we're going to focus on boot camp as this idea, a short period in which we can change ourselves to be in better spiritual shape and help to further the kingdom of God through intense focus and effort. Now, by short period, I'm thinking, uh, I don't know, how about 40 days? Does that sound like a good time frame to everyone? 
Well, I hope so. So let's get going to boot camp for the soul. Now, the first thing that needs to happen when you're wanting to do anything better is you have to realize that there is a need for a change to occur. Think about it. If you feel like you're in perfect shape, then you're not going to devote any time into getting into better shape. You have to first think, hey, I'm getting a little soft around the middle here. I better start making a change. Now, spiritually, we find ourselves with that same thought as well. You know, I'm a good Christian. I'm doing everything right. No need to make any changes. But with a little bit of self-reflection, I think we can always find something that we could be doing or working on spiritually. And that is not a bad thing. It is not a bad thing to think about how you can change and grow to be more like Christ. The problem becomes when you find a way that you can change or that you should change in order to grow in Christ and you choose not to try to change. You see, the temptation to stay the same is very strong in most of us. The saying, no one likes change, is popular for a reason. Change is hard. It requires that you be willing to admit there is a problem in the first place, and it requires effort. It requires that you continue that effort when something goes wrong, because something will always go wrong at some point. It requires that you are willing to adapt when you are not seeing the results that you are aiming for. So we can see that that temptation to stay the same is very strong. Now, there are other temptations that can be part of change as well. You see, there is a problem that we run into in our lives every single day, and that is the temptation to change for the worse. We want to believe our efforts to make changes are always for the better, but if we do not identify the reason why we need to change and what our goals or that outcome are, we are tempted to change in the wrong ways. In our scripture for today, we find Jesus being tempted in the desert by the devil. The devil tempts him to use his powers to feed himself. He tempts him to use his standing to call upon his father to save him. And he tempts him with the promise of ultimate power over this world. And each of these things would have been difficult. A difficult temptation for Christ to overcome. I want you to think about it. You're in the desert and you're hungry. Bread would sound pretty good. You are the son of God. You know that he will save you. The devil has challenged you to show him that he will save you. The temptation to show the devil you, you don't have any power over God. He's going to catch me and I'm going to show you that he's going to catch me would be strong. And finally, Jesus could have thought, I can have power over this world. I don't have to suffer the terrible death that is awaiting me. Now, each of these would have been a tough temptation for Christ to overcome. But thankfully for us, Jesus sees these temptations for what they are. He sees that each of them would move him away from God. He looks at the devil and says, I don't need bread to live. I need the word of God. He says, I don't need to tempt my father to save me. I know that he already will. He says, I don't need this kingdom because there's one far greater that I'm already a part of. And oh, by the way, devil, you're not even close to being worthy of my worship the way that my father is. You see, each of these situations, Jesus sees through what the devil is really trying to do with his temptations. He sees that he's trying to bring about a change in Jesus for the worse. He tempts him to move away from his belief in the word of God. He tempts him to move away from his reliance upon God. And he tempts him to move away from the purpose that God has put in his life. Now, when we think about our own lives, the temptations that are put before us are very much the same as the temptations that the devil put before Jesus. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Pastor, I've never found myself in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights being tempted by the devil. 
No one's ever come to me and said, I'll give you the whole world if you just worship me. Well, maybe not in those exact words, but I promise you, you've been tempted with similar things. You see, our world is full of temptation. There is constant pressure applied to us by the media, by our friends, and even by our families. And these temptations are not always bad. Hear that. Temptation is not always bad. Temptation can be good if it brings about the right change. But more often than not, they do not bring about the right change. In the media, we're constantly bombarded with messages of temptation. That is what advertising is. It is a short clip of information that is meant to tempt us into doing something. Think about the last time you watched television. I mean, I guess for most of us, it hasn't been that long. Probably last night, maybe even this morning when you got up. Do you remember the last ad that you saw for some sort of alcohol? In that ad, what were the people doing? They were having fun, right? Most likely doing something fun. Everyone's smiling and laughing and having a good time and cheersing and the beer's looking cold and frosty with the ice falling down it, right? And they're always skinny. And they're always skinny, too. So, what you don't see in an ad like that is people picking themselves up off the floor the next day. What you don't see is how a person that is fighting alcohol withdrawal sy symptoms shakes violently. You don't see the homes that are broken by addiction or the mistakes that are made by someone when they're intoxicated. And you don't see the families that have lost loved ones to drunk drivers. You see, when it comes to temptation, the people that are trying to sell something to you only want to show you the good results and never the bad. And I want you to hear me, church. I'm not condemning anyone who's ever drank alcohol, and I'm not condemning anyone who is an alcoholic. If anything, I want to help more. But to condemn someone who has drank alcohol would be the highest form, highest form of hypocrisy from this pulpit. So you will never hear me say that. But the problem is with temptation, they only show you the good. They never show you the bad. The question that we have to ask ourselves whenever we face temptation, whatever it is, is if I give in to this temptation, is it going to bring me closer to God or is it going to move me further away from God? We need to think about how Jesus used the temptations of the devil in the desert to move closer to God. Each and everything that the devil put before him, he responded back to him saying different sayings about how God was with him or how he needed God with him. So as we move forward in our boot camp this Lenten season, let us focus on finding temptations that are part of our lives and really examine them to see if they are bringing us closer or further away from God. Now one final thing to consider when thinking about temptations is this. Is there something that started as a temptation in your life, but then became a habit? Is there something that you gave into once and then and said to yourself, just this one time, that's it, that's only. But then you find yourself doing it over and over again. Now, if you find yourself in that situation today, I want you to take heart because though you might feel as though you have failed, as long as there is breath in your lungs, there is time to turn things around. I want you to hear Psalm chapter 32, verses 5 through 7. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. You see, if you're willing to confess your sins, if you're willing to ask God to forgive you and to turn away from that sin, God is willing to forgive you. 
No matter how many times you've had these temptations, no matter how many times you've given in to them, if we're willing to confess and turn away, God is still willing to forgive. So let us move forward in this season thanking God for his forgiveness. And let us ask him for strength to resist those temptations that are going to move us away from him. Let us do our best to move closer to him in all that we do. So my challenge for you this week is just this. What is one way that you can move closer to God during this Lenten season? Amen.